morning. I'm going to try to uh, kind of keep it simple. I'm going to be talking about brain computer interface and some pretty high level technology, but fundamentally I'm just a plumber that installs the, the equipment. And so uh, there's a lot to sort of cover. Uh, these are my disclosures. I always try to highlight the relevant in particular Synchron. Uh, I'm the CMO for Synchron. I do have uh, shares in the company. So there's a financial interest there. Much bigger disclosures this is the work of a much larger team. As I said, I'm just kind of the plumber around things. Uh, there's some really amazing uh, people involved. We have a team in Melbourne, a team in Brooklyn. Actually, a team in Brooklyn is about twice as big as that picture uh, now shows uh, as the company's really been taking off. Uh, and in particular in the team, I'd highlight Tom Oxley, who's the CEO and uh, on the left, um, uh, Nick Opie and Peter Yu, who are the other two there in order. Uh, they've really been a lot of the majority of intellectual capital in developing this. Uh, I was very fortunate to have Tom as a fellow many years ago and be able to mentor him through this process. I've also discovered that Australians like to take very fancy pictures for their slides and talks, so they, they really do that. Um, and, and, and really Tom is the inspiration, uh, for this direction. Uh, in 2010, he was, uh, on a break. He was doing his PhD or about to do his PhD. And, uh, he went and visited a very well-known BCI doctor in, in Boston, uh, at MGH. And while he was there, he sketched, this is his actual first sketch of the concept of doing transvascular, uh, BCI while sitting in a Starbucks after that meeting, after he was all jazzed. And so he worked during his PhD at, uh, in Melbourne on this concept, and they did some sheep work that was very promising. And that's when I was lucky enough to meet Tom and, and sort of take him under my wing in, in terms of uh, some of the business development side and, and transitioning into clinical application. And so that's why I would like to say uh, we have still a long way to go, but in reality, the future is here already. Uh, we're using this technology in people and positively affecting their lives which is uh, what has me so excited about this. Uh, and, you know, we were talking last night, there's, a, there's always a give and take. Uh, Elon's going for something where he's going to sew in, you know, essentially a computer into your brain, theoretically, so that there's like very high level of data in and out. We're instead trying to give people like a video game controller where you've got, you know, forward, backwards, left, right, maybe five or six buttons that you can press on. But with that video game controller, you can do almost anything. For, uh, for instance, I'm doing a fair amount of work trying to develop new vascular robotics and surgical robotics. Nowadays, they're all being driven through, you know, sort of a video game console kind of engagement. And so that future is imminently doable. But to start the conversation, you got to wonder, well, what is BCI, right? What is a brain computer interface? And actually, the FDA has been uh, pretty clear on this. They have a guidance statement. They lay out sort of their uh, concept of it. But essentially, it's a system that's used to connect uh, directly to the brain or central nervous system to an external device to interact with the outside world. Um, this is the FDA guidance document that they published in 2021. Uh, and they say, BCIs, and this is key, are neuroprostheses that restore lost motor sensory capability. Think about that. You're basically creating a prosthetic nerve pathway. When you want to send out a motor signal, you have motor intent. Your cortex thinks that you want to wiggle your finger, and then it goes through a whole pathway. There can be a breakdown in that pathway anywhere. And the BCI is a prosthetic that allows that signal to get out into the outside world. BCI is the FDA's language, has the potential to bring benefit to people with severe disabilities by increasing their ability to interact with their environment and consequent, consequently providing new independence in daily life. So when you first think about, I don't know, when I first think about BCI, I think about you know, getting a really cool exoskeleton where I can jump you know, over buildings or do all kinds of, you know, maybe a jetpack or something really big. But the truth is for people that are suffering paralysis, even small changes can have a dramatic effect in their lives with the ability to interact in the digital world in particular, if you think of how much of our life is dependent on just being able to interface with our smartphones or with our computers to be able to WhatsApp people or send emails or do calls or doing your online banking. And so if you can facilitate that, you can do a lot. So this is a concept that everyone's aware of, right? So if your cortex is intact, you think of what you want to do, and then the signal pathway goes all the way out to your muscles. You say, I want to turn on the light, it goes out to your finger, you flip the switch, you turn on the light, right? And uh, paralysis is a situation where there's impaired motor capability. You can't do that. And it's important to realize that you don't want BCI to be said, oh, it's going to treat just ALS or it's going to treat just this or that. I liken it to sort of like spinal cord stimulators, right? 
there you could have any number of reasons why you have spine pain a pain syndrome but you use a spinal cord stimulator to treat that pain syndrome whatever the etiology bci can be used to treat paralysis whatever the etiology whether it's loss of limb whether it's als whether it's um trauma whether it's stroke um uh, or any of these potential conditions and the problem's huge right if you when you put together all of this population there are a great number of people that have a significant need uh, in the U.S., if we can then take that motor intent, the thought that I want to, I want to turn that light switch on, and and what we do is we read that on the motor cortex, send it to a transmitter that's down right here below the clavicle in a little pocket, just like we do for DBS or for cardiac based masers or other things, and that can send out a simple Bluetooth signal, and that Bluetooth can interact with any variety of technologies as one would want, right? And so that's the concept: neural signal, an algorithm decodes it goes to this little transmitter and we send what we call a digital motor output. We've converted the thought of motor intent to a digital signal that can allow you to interact with the outside world. There are over 5 million people in the US living with paralysis. It's a tremendous, tremendous problem. And as we talked about, it could be from any number of sources or reasons. So if we can change this, we can dramatically affect these lives. I'm gonna show you some examples. And when you talk about globally, the burden of disease for mild limb impairment so that they can't, people can't control devices, either loss of limbs, severe arthritis, uh, paralysis, any of these other things, you, you get to over 90 million people that are potentially could benefit from using this technology. We're also standing on the shoulder of giants. A lot of people have made tremendous progress. Um, a really sort of seminal paper was published by Lee Hochberg, who's also an advisor with us now, uh, in 2006 in Nature using uh, what's called a Utah array. It's a whole bunch of little needles, like a microchip that can go in. Um, and they could get between 70, about 70, 95% uh, accuracy. Uh, and they've sh shown that they can do some pretty amazing things. You can get a high, a lot of, um, a lot of data output can be captured. You can drive a robotic arm, you can interact with a computer. Accuracy is sometimes an issue, but the big issue is that the tissue develops gliosis over time. And so the fidelity of any of these implants goes down quite regularly, right? If you think about any time you touch the brain or you put in any implant in the body and you develop a capsule around it or your, your body's natural mechanisms. And then also you have infection risk. These are transcutaneous technologies. So the people have big probes that come out of their head and they can have to be removed and closed and infections is significant risk. And that's what really helped me fall in love with this concept of technology. So this is a woman at a pipeline for a giant aneurysm. Uh, this is just like a few weeks ago that uh, it wasn't working. So I ended up bringing her and clipping the aneurysm. Um, but what I love is what you can see in that picture. If you look at the carotid artery, you can see the pipeline on the outside of the artery, right? The, the stent works its way through the, the layers of the stent of, of the vessel and are in the sort of outer wall and adventitia immediately adjacent to the brain. And yet there's no adhesion and there's no scarring and there's no development of sort of natural processes. We're taking advantage of the body's natural sequestration of the vascular system from the brain. And that's the concept here. Now, we were talking about sort of single cell recordings with that Utah array, um, but this, if you're, if you're putting sort of a, an electrode array in a vessel, you're not gonna get that single cell level recording, but instead you're getting what we call electrocorticography or ECOG, right? But the, the thing is, is that has tremendous potential. There was a paper published in New England Journal back in 2016 where people did this. They did a fully supplantable system. So it's sort of like a neuro pace where they replaced them with a skull and implanted the whole thing in a patient. Um, and they were able to show that this patient could go home and use it and, and have success. Now, one character per 52 seconds. It's not high fidelity at this point, but they're showing that this patient can do this from a completely implantable system. And, mm, excuse me. Uh, and then more recently in 2021, Eddie Chang at UCSF published a really groundbreaking paper. It's really amazing where they put electrocorticography over the motor areas for speech able to decode those to the, the limited phenomes that exist in, in, in our English language speech, and then use AI to, to help predict based on the signals they got. And literally people could speak by thinking. So they could think of the words they wanted to put out and the computer would speak the sentences. Really, really pretty amazing. Um, 
So if we can do that, if you can generate speech from ECOG, imagine all of the things you could do with, it shows you the overall power of ECOG. Now, the challenges to, to that system and how they did that, again, this is a transvascular system. So it comes out, uh, sorry, a transcutaneous system. So you can see in that picture, this is from the paper, the technology is violating the skin. So there's an infection risk. He actually did this. It's really amazing with like off the shelf grid electrodes like we put in for people for seizure monitoring. They just jerry-rigged the whole thing and stuck it in together. Um, but this is, it's trans, it's it's not really practical. It's not imminent. And if you look behind them in that thing, in that box, there's like a big air condition unit thing. And that's the processing unit that they needed to make it work. So this isn't the kind of thing where someone's going to be walking around and have, it's something that gets done in a lab uh, and in that use. But these are, I actually put this together. These are the actual computers I had at the different times of my life. And right, and you can see technology progresses, right? And so that big air condition unit, we got to shrink it down to make it better. Um, these are the, the actual ones I had over the times. And that's what we're trying to do with Synchron and, and with uh, uh, the Stentrode. And so basically, if you look at this, uh, and we published the first two patients ever implanted in JNIS uh, back in 2021, um, but it's an endovascular array that's able to read the electrocorticography of the brain, and it goes to a wireless unit that's in the subclavicular space. Uh, so it's much smaller and much more practical and imminently usable. We map, use functional MRI to map the, the motor cortex and, and premotor regions, and then we target placing the stent in that region. Um, so here's just some videos. This is what we do is we put little targets uh, based off of the MRI into the angio suite. We correlate those with the anatomic landmarks. And actually, for, for some of the imaging systems, you can actually uh, co-register the MRI with the imaging software. And then this is actually the first human being in the world. This is us. Uh, this was in Melbourne uh, deploying the Stentrode. The new version will be much more visible. You can faintly see it there being deployed. And here's a 3D. You can see the lead coming down the sinus and, and going out uh, down to the jugular. Um, then you connect it down below to, to uh, uh, a little connector into the uh, a little transmitter that's that's quite small. It's like size of a large matchbox or so, maybe two matchboxes. Um, and so the switch trial we did in Australia, it was for up to five patients. We enrolled five. One patient ended up not having favorable anatomy. We never did a procedure. They failed the screening MRA or MRD, but we enrolled four patients with the device itself. The goal was set. And this is, I love this video. This is the first time uh, the device has ever been used. And so this gentleman's using it uh, in connection with, with eye tracking, but he's using the device to click, open a Word doc and start typing. Um, and you can see he's just at home, he's just using a laptop, uh, and he's using Bluetooth, and he's pretty blown away um, by doing it. This was our very first patient. Uh, and here's a gentleman he's doing, he's using it to type, so he's doing typing exercises, type the word year, and so he's using the device to, to type it out in the interest of time a little quicker. And then I love this, there's a couple things this highlights, this picture, this, this guy's using this to open WhatsApp. The use, the, the, so this guy's version of ALS made him extremely hypophonic, so he couldn't reach out to his caregiver. So his wife, who was his wife, his wife felt very uncomfortable even leaving the room he was in because he couldn't yell across the house. With the technology and the ability to interact with WhatsApp, she now felt she could go to the store, she could do whatever because he couldn't uh, reach him. So just having access to that was transformational. The other thing that I love about this is it's outside in a bright sunroom which for those of you that have worked with eye tracking software, eye tracking really struggles in bright light. It's not a very, not very facile there. And the last thing is you can see, he just has a generic off the shelf laptop that's propped up on a bunch of books, right? There's no big giant processing unit. It's not in a laboratory. This is at home and it's eminently usable for him. Uh, this gentleman, uh, again, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but he's using this now. I'm oh, sorry, he's using this to turn on a light uh, in his house. So they're using it to like turn on the lights on and off if they want it on or off. Uh, and this is a great one. This is two patients who uh, we sort of, cool. Tom's very good at promote promotion, which you have to be for a company. He coordinated them having sort of an online conversation talking to each other. Uh, and, and they sort of live tweeted it and, and made a thing about it, which was pretty fun. Working to gamify it to improve the accuracy and technique, right? So they got to click on the button to make the dinosaur jump over the cactuses uh, as they work. And, and developing other technologies. The goal of this study, the SWITCH study, was to make sure it was safe. It was primarily a safety study. You can see there were no significant adverse effects in any of the patients. One patient had a transient headache, one patient had a little bit of bruising, but that was it. Um, 
There was no evidence of stenosis, stent migration, or any other problems. And the fidelity stayed strong throughout the life of every patient who, for the entire life of the patient who had uh, the stentrode. Um, and you can see here just each the, an electrode giving various signal changes depending on movements. So here's the idea. The patient, what we're doing is we're giving a button. The patient isn't thinking, turn on the light to turn on the light. They're thinking to, to what we consider like press a button. So that button might be any stereotyped movement. So they think, push my foot down, you know, move my foot up and down. They move their foot up and down. The computer gets used to seeing that pattern of signals so that then whenever they want to, to turn on, to use that button, they think that they're going to move my foot up and down. But if, they're, if they have it plugged into the computer, it turns on the computer. If they have it plugged onto the light, it turns on the light or whatever use they want with that application. Um, the other thing that's amazing for, for the traditional systems is just right now, most of them need, or all of them to date, need months of training to develop it. And after the first patient, and this was interesting, the first patient took so many sessions because we were really, we were kind of controlling everything. And they realized the better thing to do was just let them play with it and let the algorithm, let the AI learn as they were playing with it. And all the other patients within two or five sessions were using the technology at home independently to improve their life. Um, we're developing new games. This is a, a putting game. So as it rolls around, they click the, the button to make the ball move towards wherever they've clicked and they try to sink the putt, uh, just other ways to sort of train them and, and improve outcomes. We're learning tricks about how to minimize cardiac um, interference because the cardiac electrical activity is so high. So the conclusion of that study was it was safe. We had high fidelity. It's minimally invasive and it's extremely um, usable and doable. Uh, and with ECOG, you can eventually interpret some pretty complex outcomes. Uh, we published this in JAMA Neurology uh, a number of years ago. Uh, no serious adverse events. It was able to use easily. There was no negative effects on the patient's lifestyles. And they all had improvements to their IDLs. And I want to share some of the quotes from the patients. So this was The Economist did an article. And the, he says, that from a physical perspective, the best thing is you don't know it's there, right? It's like a pacemaker or something. You don't even know it's there. There's no irritation. For me, it's become part of my life. It's quite seamless, giving you back the ability to be independent. There's no doubt from my perspective, this gave me a reason to live. Uh, pretty, pretty awesome stuff. Um, and then they said, you know, what is it doing? He's like, well, to be fair, I have a first generation device. Uh, they're going to make it better. But this one enables me to use emails, use apps like WhatsApp and scroll. So whatever you can do on a computer, I can do. And just giving him access to his to digital life uh, was very empowering. So now we're doing the command study. Um, we've it's a six patient study. We've enrolled. Uh, we've implanted five. We just consented the the sixth one actually. That was going to be in UPMC at the end of the month. Uh, this is funded by an NIH grant um, and is an FDA approved clinical trial. Um, so far, uh, there's been an excellent safety profile. We have had a patient develop a. Um, a pocket. We, we didn't have any Australia, but one US patient. He was a, he was a very long-term ALSer. He's had it for like 10 years. He's very debilitated, uh, but he had a wound healing problem with his pocket. So we had to take the, gen, the, the IRTU out, um, but it was really good. But this is, uh, and I'm going to end with this and be able to take questions, but this is a great one I love. So this guy, let me see. I hope I can do this. Is this going to start it playing? Okay, good. So he's using this right now to control his the iPhone is propped up in front of him. He's just using the device. He's not using anything else. And he's uh, communicating to his caregiver that he has pain and discomfort and where the pain is and how much it is, right? And he's this is something that he normally couldn't do. The caregiver had to be paying attention to him. They had to be pointing at a, at a, at a board. And it was very difficult. And you'll see, watch his face. Look at him smile. I mean, it's just so like... The ability to get, it seems simple, but to get that information out and communicate to his caregiver uh, really has changed this gentleman's life and, and made a huge impact. And with that, I'll leave you. This is that first video I showed you. This is the right at the moment that he used it for the very first time and was successfully able to do it. That's his wife with him. And they were just, you know, so ecstatic that it was very touching. Um, and so it's, a, it's really exciting. Like I said, we're about to finish command. If anyone's interested in being part of the pivotal trial, which we hope to start up in late Q1 or Q2 of next year, um, happy to, to consider you. We're doing prelim site evals now. And with that, I'll have to take any questions.
Oh, uh, thank, thank you, Jay. Uh, un unbelievable or fantastic. I don't know what the right adjective is, but uh, so, so motivating. You know, for years, we thought about paralyzed people being unsalvageable from a peripheral nerve aspect because the motor in plate died at 24 months or so. But this, there's really no uh, long-term uh, um, endpoint that they, they could be par paralyzed for years, right? That's correct. And so that's another very important thing. We never had that option in neurosurgery to extend the, the time limit of intervention out. So thank you. I'll open it up for questions. I had a question. Uh, are the patients required to go on blood thinners? I know you said at the 12 month call up, there was no instant stenosis, but like theoretically, if it, if they developed a blood clot, like would the device still work? You know, would, would uh, well, the would device the would work, but the obvious worry would be that they'd have a venous infarct. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you in 2015 and 16, when we were first planning this, that go, you know, stenting for IIH really wasn't a common thing. Stenting for tinnitus wasn't a common thing. This was, we were very nervous about that aspect of it. I can tell you now that the field has made so much progress in the last seven, eight years in terms of comfortability with stenting in the sinus system. Um, it's an extremely low risk proposition. None of these patients have had any, every one has gotten three month and six month and one year vascular imaging of their sinus system. None have developed any instant stenosis or thrombosis or any clinical sequelae of that. We do put them on aspirin and Plavix, uh, which is typical for stenting in the vasculature for three months. And then after that, we stop the Plavix to keep them on aspirin. I have a quick question about the data that you're collecting. Um, just out of curiosity, number one, are you, are you keeping those data points, the AI data points, so that the system can learn from multiple patients together? And the secondary to that question is, are people's, uh, I don't know how to even describe it, are people's information, electrical information that's coming out that the AI is using, is that similar across people? As in, if I was to think about my finger twitching, is it the same as another person thinking about their finger moving? I, I mean, our N right now is, as you can see, is nine patients. Um, so it's it's hard to tell. But the, the short answer is not really. <laughs> Actually, everyone's pretty different. And in fact, people use, what, what ends up happening is everyone has a few stereotype movement thoughts that work better. So not everyone has the same. So for instance, in that picture with the wife and uh, the, the word, if I had audio, if I was playing the video, what she just said there is when they laugh is she's like, did you clench your bum? Because well, like the thing that worked best for him that the AI picked up is when he sort of clenched his glutes, that's what it would recognize. Uh, so everyone has uh, different sort of signals that it picks up better so far. And I'm sure at some point there'll be some learning there, but we, we haven't gotten there yet. So uh, question, Dr. Mocha. Yes. Uh, you, um, so there's no like lifeline to this, uh, uh, prosthesis is never going to malfunction, or do you have any data with it surviving for two years or three years? Or so the longest a, a, one pa every unfortunately. So we just implanted our first stroke patient two patients ago. Um, before that, and since that, every patient's had ALS, and so all of those patients um, so far have progressed to death within two years of time. Um, unfortunately, so. We have no indication that there's deterioration in function for as long as we've observed, but we don't have, you know, four or five year data yet on people. Seems like it should be fine. It's all, you know, it's grown in, it's endothelialized, it should be okay. Hey, uh, Jay, I got a question. You've done nine patients in how many years? Uh, well, we did the first four in 2020, 2019 and 20 in Australia. Then there was a gap yeah. for 2021, 2022, um, while we moved to the U.S. And then 2022 and 2023, we've done the subsequent, uh, so far, uh, five patients here in the U.S. So, so we're enrolling about one every two or three months. So in 2030, what is the projected general up? What What's the curve here? You know, I'm thinking about, uh, Julian starting out talking about Elon Musk and, you know, we're all going to have a computer in two years in our brain. You know, what, what's the up ramp here? Um, 
so so there was just a, a big sort of BCI meeting in Europe and the FDA convened like an informal panel. They didn't actually convene it, but they encouraged everyone to get together and talk while they were sitting there. And, uh, and so there was this sort of panel discussion. Uh, it looks like they're probably only going to require something like between 50 and 100 uh, patients for uh, sort of a, pin of a pivotal trial for this to potentially become marketable, you know, commercial. Um, you know, we, for, for instance, it, like any trial for any, you guys have all done this. When you do a trial, it's very slow as it goes and starts to ramp up. Like, even if you look over the last two years for enrollment in this trial, it was like one, then there was another one, like eight months. And there was another one, like four months. And now we're doing them like one every month, the last like three months. And so, and that's just with originally one center. And then we just, we just added Buffalo two months ago. So, um, so we have a total of three centers now, uh, for that, for command trial. Uh, when we roll out for the pivotal, we're going to have 20 or something like that. Um, and so I would expect that this device could complete that trial by uh, 2025 and then, you know, get approval and we could have a commercial product to provide for patients by 2026. I think that's a very conservative and reasonable expectation, barring you never know with the FDA. Yep. Uh, David Wu, a uh, quick question about um, upgrades. You had talked about potentially having this in the uh, patient for years, maybe decades. Mm -hmm. um, if I have a first generation device, um, can you maybe speak to what it would look like to upgrade to a third generation or fifth generation device and maybe how uh, this methodology could be different from other brain uh, computer interfaces? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And that's frankly why the vast majority of the patients are ALS patients as well. Uh, so the first study, we were just doing that, but um, people do have concerns about that. And if you're a person who you expect, you know, let's say you're a young person who had a, a motorcycle accident or something, you, you know, we've had those conversations with those patients and they're like, it's your first generation device. I want to wait. Whereas the ALS patients, they're like, Hey, let, hit me with what you got right now. Cause I don't have as, uh, as long. Um, and so that is a reality. We don't have a good you know, this grows into your body. As I showed you in that picture, it's, there's no taking it out once it's in, um, you know, down the road, we develop a way to, to put another one in, but to be honest, I don't see why you couldn't have many of these theoretically, um, depending on what the profile is of the wire and, and how much, you know, vessel uh, space you're taking up, but once it's in, it's in. And so that is, that's something to be con considering. Even just between what we're using now and what we're gonna use in the pivotal trial is gonna be a significant upgrade in the technology. I mean, every every patient so far has been implanted with the exact same first generation device, um, which is dramatically technically inferior to the one we're gonna be using in the pivotal. Looking long-term, do you have any optimism about motor versus speech or other sensory modalities? Absolutely. Um, so right now, I mean, obviously we're going for the the very straightforward, you know, stuff, but there's no reason why this couldn't, you couldn't use it for a lot more in terms of measuring speech signals. Like I said, you could potentially have multiple in where you're able to tri triangulate, you know, you have multiple points of performing your ECOG. Um, there's also, we've published a paper in, I think it was in Nature Biotechnology now, it's been many years. Um, showing you we can stimulate. And so the, the well, although we're not doing any stimulation, the device, the, the next generation device does have the ability to stimulate if we down the road ever wanted to do that. Um, so you could do closed loop feedback for seizures and other things as well. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Great work.